The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Does John 3.16 mean trusting, relying, or clinging to Jesus? And when was Zacchaeus eternally saved? Why won't God listen to a man's prayer if he mistreats his wife? Hello there. Thank you for tuning in today to Grace in Focus. This is the radio and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. You can find out more about us by going to our website, faithalone.org. We have many articles about our free grace theology. There are blogs and videos, past episodes of this podcast, and our magazine, Grace in Focus. You can find them all there at faithalone.org. Now with today's lightning round of questions, here's Bob Wilkin, along with Philippe Sterling. Well, y'all, I have a bunch of questions and Philippe, I'm going to try to get three or four in this one show. Are you ready? So it's like the final fireworks, you know, just... It's the lightning round. It's <laughs> the lightning round. All right. They're kind of questions I think we can answer briefly. First of all, Mark asks, does faith in Christ in John 3.16 mean trusting, clinging, and relying on Jesus for eternal salvation? Well, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but has everlasting life. I don't know of a single translation that translates into English John 3.16 as whoever trusts in him. Or whoever clings to him. None of them say clings or relies on him, right? Yes, it's just a simple matter of being persuaded of the promise he makes, that it's true. My answer then, or our answer to Mark is no. Faith in Christ in John 3.16 does not mean trusting, clinging, relying, unless those words are synonyms for believing. Now, sometimes trusting has the same connotation, but often, for example, if I go to a doctor and I'm facing surgery, like I had cataract surgery back in March, I did research. I went to three different ophthalmologists, checked them out, all out, looked at their reviews, and I believed that the one I picked was an excellent choice. I believed he would do his best, and I trusted him to do the surgery. I did not believe that I was guaranteed to come out with 20-20 vision. I wasn't even trusting that I wouldn't come out blind in one eye. I had no guarantee. People have been blinded in cataract surgery. What I did believe is that this man was a well-trained person. He had plenty of experience, and he would do his best. But when we believe in Jesus, John 3.16, we're not trusting that he's going to do his best, right? We're not trusting that he's going to try to take us to the kingdom. We're convinced and persuaded that this is a done deal, right? Yes, we know that he is the giver who gives that gift of everlasting life. And unlike the doctor, you know, it's not just a matter of doing the best, but a matter of it's a guarantee. So when Jesus says to Martha in John 11, 26, do you believe this? That's more than do you trust this? Do you cling to this? Do you rely on this? I understand some people are going to say these things are actual synonyms. Well, if so, then why use them? If they mean exactly the same thing as believing, then just use believing. A hundred times in the Bible, more than a hundred, we're told the only condition is believing in the Lord mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. I think Mark is looking for that and looking for confirmation from us that, yes, it is simply believing, simply being persuaded. Second, Shannon. This is a pretty simple one, but it's hard, too. Could you give me the names of several undergraduate Bible schools or Christian education programs you would recommend. I'm looking for something with an online degree option. Well, that's difficult, especially coming from a free grace perspective. I don't think there are many schools, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, whether it's Bible college or seminary, that are going to be clear on the grace issue. So every place is going to require discernment. Right. Right. And a lot of them teach what's called spiritual formation, which we have a problem with. I know you've written on it. I've written on it. 
It's part of contemplative spirituality, and it's a big problem in Christian education today. So you have to be aware of that, too. But I have some friends that have, for example, Liberty University. I have some friends that have gotten uh, graduate degrees, masters and doctorates from Liberty online. And so they have everything well in place right. and, and provide an excellent education, but still requiring you know, discernment. Right. You know, I think they're basically free grace friendly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Luther Rice, Catherine Wright, um, Ken's daughter, she's our missions coordinator. She goes on mission trips. She got a, a master's degree from Luther Rice. And I think she found it to be some a school that was definitely friendly to the free grace position. And you mentioned Cedarville in now, Ohio. Now, Cedarville generally has had a good reputation as a Christian college, but in the last few years, they have adopted that the spiritual formation approach also for Christian growth, a contemplative aspects uh, of that. So knowing that's problematic, right. but generally it is a good liberal arts Christian and there education are other, there. And there yeah. are other schools like that, and you can look at them, but... We have started our own online seminary, and we're offering classes, but they're not undergraduate. It's an unaccredited online, Grace Evangelical online seminary, and we're offering a Master of Divinity over the course of taking, I believe it's 24 uh, classes, or 22 classes plus two class credits for a thesis. And people can do that, but that would be after you finish your college. Okay, here's a third question, and this is about Zacchaeus. Now, you and I talked about Zacchaeus yeah, on a, a recent show. Back. Yeah. yeah, So we're not going to go into detail here, but Zacchaeus is in Luke 19. And tell us the quick story of Zacchaeus. What happens in this story? Of course, Jesus, you know, comes through, and Zacchaeus is ecstatic about Jesus, you know, coming. And the crowds are there and prevent. He's a short, wee little man, as the <laughs> song you know goes. Right. And so he can't see Jesus through the crowd, but he anticipates where Jesus is going to walk. And there's a sycamore tree there, and he climbs up and so has a good view of Jesus. And Jesus deliberately comes to where he is and invites him to come down and says, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to your house. Right. And have a meal with you. Yeah. Which would have been problematic, you know, for the Jews there concerning Why? a tax. What was his Zacchaeus job? was a tax gatherer. He was a chief. So he hurries down and joyfully, you know, invites Jesus to, to his house, sits down and and engages in, I guess, a good conversation over a meal with him. And finally, at some point, he says, Lord, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to return fourfold whatever I may have overcharged people. More than that, I also give half of what I have for that. So he even doubles what the law required in right. terms of, of giving back, you know, what you have defrauded anyone. So, and then Jesus says, you know, marvels at that. And he says, truly, salvation has come to this man's house. And it's today. And it's today. 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 So what Richard asks, he's talking about a blog that Ken Yates wrote in which Ken says, quote, clearly Zacchaeus is a believer, unquote. And I think that Richard was maybe reading the Spanish. We have our blogs translated in other languages because he puts it in Spanish here. And maybe it was translated slightly differently or something, but he thinks that Ken was saying Zacchaeus was a believer before he came down from the sycamore tree and before he heard Jesus. And that's not what Ken was saying, and that's Mm -hmm. not what we're saying. When he says, today salvation has come to his house, for he too is a son of Abraham. Well, he was physically a son of Abraham before that day, but he became a spiritual son of Abraham that day. And so we need to recognize that the order would be, first of all, oh yeah, by the way, he goes on to say, wouldn't it be more accurate that when the account begins, it seems that Zacchaeus is a seeker? Well, we'd agree, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, he he has heard about Jesus and he, he wants to see him and makes every effort, you know, to do that. So he is seeking in that sense. And he, at some point... He comes to believe in Jesus. So he goes Jesus, from being Jesus, a seeker to a believer. To a believer. And then after that, he seems to say, okay, I'm going to, in essence, follow. He you. becomes a follower. He, he becomes a follower. Yeah. And that's the sequence it should be for yeah. all of us. Yes. Seeker, believer, yeah. follower. Well, 
Okay, very good. Thanks, Richard. And if we have time, we're going to try to get one final one. This is a tough question, but I think we can get it in. Adrian says, I understand that Christians have their sins removed from them as far as the East is from the West, and we are forgiven once for all. How is it that God will not listen to a husband's prayer if he mistreats his wife, according to 1 Peter 3, 7? Well, I think the point to recognize here is there's something called fellowship forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 talks about that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Also, Luke eleven fourteen, Father, forgive us our uh, debts forgive. as we've forgiven our debtors. Yes. Right? Also, 1 Peter 3, 7. So I think the point is, if we mistreat our spouses then we are not experiencing God's fellowship forgiveness. Therefore, our prayers are hindered. That's the way Peter calls it. And same thing with the Lord's Prayer. If we refuse to have a forgiving spirit and act toward others, then that affects our fellowship with God. Right. And the issue is not that somehow uh, when we believe in Christ, somehow we're always in fellowship with God. No, we have to be honest with God and confess our sins as we're aware of them in order to stay in fellowship with him. Right. Now, it is true that, you know, the the death of Christ is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. Right. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So the barrier of sin has been removed. So that's no longer the issue for anyone. Right. If that's what Adrian's talking about... That's John one twenty nine, first mm-hmm. John two two. Right. And that's a done deal once for all. Yeah, and that's else. true of the unbeliever too. Right. But yet, you know what the the matter is, you no know, for the unbelieving, for anyone, eternal life is still needed. Absolutely. The barrier of sin is removed, but everlasting life is needed. And once and we pro- have everlasting life, we do not have unending forgiveness. We have to confess our sins. Now There's the issue of is there such a thing as positional forgiveness, and we've talked about that on previous shows, but clearly there's something called fellowship forgiveness, and that's what 1 John 1, 9 is talking about, and that's the issue in 1 Peter 3, 7, is that if a believer is out of fellowship with God, then his prayers will be hindered. If he's mistreating his wife, then he's not in fellowship with God, and that hinders his prayers. Well, thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Philippe. This has been a fun... Uh, oh, it's been good to be so. back with you again. Yes. And, and with everyone out there. And we'll yeah. uh, look forward to having you again soon. And in the meantime, keep grace in focus. Are you interested in finding other Free Grace believers just like yourself in your area? On our website, we have a church tracker. It's an easy-to-use map that will help you locate those other Free Grace churches that might be in your area. It's at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you've got a question, comment, or some feedback. If you do, please don't hesitate to send us a message. Here's our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next episode, in the kingdom, some believers will rule and some will not. Will the non-rulers be jealous? I hope you'll join us, and until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.